Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Daniel Gormali. Welcome back to my channel, Hometown Chess Hero. Um, and today we're going to talk about calculation. How do you calculate? Uh, should you calculate when it's your opponent's turn to move? Should you calculate long variations? Should you be looking for unusual candidate moves? These are the kind of things that crop up when you calculate. And other things that are worth bearing in mind are process elimination, full surviving variations, so trying to find what's wrong with variation. That was mentioned in Michael Adams' book. So today we're looking at the game Michael Adams versus Andre Volokh. Kitten uh, from Andre Volokitin is from the Ukraine. Mark Adams is from Turo in Cornwall in England. Although Cornwall often has a sort of half hearted campaign, I would say, to break away from uh, the UK. But in this game, We have had Adams has played Bishop B5 check Sicilian. We've seen him play this more and more often. He used to play the open Sicilian quite a lot, but now he plays uh, opening that Ash he's played for a large part of his career. And kind of a, a uh, quiet variation by White, which is slowly building up the centre. Interesting move, d4. So this is where Volokitin is thinking. Should Adams be thinking here? Will Adams be thinking? I believe he probably will be. He'll be sat there crunching through the variations. As I played Adams before. He doesn't tend to get up much from the board. I think he sits down a lot. Maybe he thinks, uh, you know, I don't have that much longer in my career. I need to make every minute count. Uh, so I don't think he, uh, he, you know, he will get up occasionally. But yeah, so that's the question. Yeah, should you, if, if you're white in this position, should you be thinking uh, much about what, how your opponent can respond? You know, the first thing you think is, will they take on d4? Will they take on e4? So you'll be looking at the force to moves and captures. But it's just gone d4, which is a very aggressive move. So it's very obvious from uh, that these are the critical moves, right? Do you take on d4? Do you take on e4? Do you take with a bishop? Uh, do you push maybe c4 to block the bishop, to stop the bishop from taking on b5? These are the things that you go through. But as white, you could argue, do you need to... Um, that's an interesting argument. That maybe when it's your, your turn to play, your opponent's turn, you... To save energy, don't think about the move. Now, the old Russian advice was, you know, don't think when it's your when it's your opponent's turn to, to move. Don't generally think too much about calculate and variations. You think more about positional. I'm not sure exactly what that is. You know, what what's the positional? I mean, the position is going to change if your opponent makes a move, right? The positional aspects of the position, I guess. Um, but when it's your turn to move, you can't create variations. However, I think that very uh, that advice has changed a little bit over the years. I think nowadays in chess, uh, the players at the top are massive calculators, so they calculate uh, variations a lot. By the way, the reason I made this video is because somebody on my YouTube channel asked me to uh, create a video about calculations. So I figured. I wanted to talk a little bit about calculation, what it's like to calculate variations. Now, I'd be very surprised if this wasn't part of Adam's preparation. You know, these got, uh, these type of players tend to be very well prepared. That is why they're at the top of the tree. Um, partly the reason they do a lot of preparation. They do spend a lot of time working on their openings, refining their openings. Even though Adams plays this bishop b5 check Sicilian a lot, 
He'll spend a lot of time refining it. He'll know the ins and outs of this opening quite a lot. He uses it as a as a as an attacking weapon, as white. And he's quite good at um, converting small advantages into a win, which is something you need if if you're going to use this this type of variation which often just leads to a small advantage you're not really going for the jugular so much but this is a type of variation emanating from it where black could very easily collapse quite quickly in my opinion so let's look at the moves uh, so one move that black could play is knight e4 uh, I'm guessing white would either respond by taking on c5 or by taking on b5 now if you take on b5 you're clearly creating some kind of threat against this knight on d7 So black already has to worry about um, king safety. The king might lose the casting rights. So the obvious way to prevent that would be to play either bishop c6 or knight back to f6. So this is what you need to calculate. Bishop takes b5, bishop c6. Bishop takes, queen takes. And then there's moves like d5 where the knight becomes maroon. So I'm looking at... Okay, we go back to initial uh, variation. I'm looking at knight takes e4. So let's think about long variation. Knight takes e4, bishop takes b5, bishop c6, bishop takes, queen takes, d5. Let's say queen a4 is a move. Queen a4, b3, queen a2. Uh, queen e2. Just for the sake of argument, let's just keep... Keep going. Queen e2, queen b1, queen e4, g6, we're just going to keep going, we're just going to keep going here. Bishop g5, queen b2, rook e1, and if f6, I'll just go bishop f4. Knight e5. Now there's queen a4 check. So I'm looking at variations like this and I'm thinking, mm, this looks, I'm not certainly sure about that, but I'm thinking it looks very dangerous for black. Also, when you go that deeply, the first thing you think about is wrong variations, long variation. You know, phrases like that. Or, you know, uh, all the, the famous one by Bent Larson, all long variations are wrong. There's probably several things I was missing in that long sequence. It's not ne Is it necessary to go uh, to, you know, seven or eight moves deep? Probably not, or even further, of course. Or should you just be looking at variations of three or four moves deep? It's very true when people say that the, the, the most important thing to do is get the first few moves right. Uh, because if you don't calculate the first three or four moves correctly, you're often going to end up blundering stuff. You're going to overlook simple tactics. You know, there's no point calculating long variations correctly, uh, trying to calculate long variations, if you're getting the first three or four moves wrong and you're, you're dropping something big in the first three or four moves of your variation. So knight e4, bishop b5, bishop c6 is possible. So what about c, d4? c takes d4. I'm going to go knight takes d4. I'm going to hit b5. Can we go b4? b4. Knight b5, queen b8. Is a possible variation. Looks slightly scary. Can I go queen d4 then? Queen d, uh, queen d4. And if... If bishop takes e4, I take on uh, b4. Bishop takes e4, I take on b4. But then you can play maybe e6. Knight on 1 to c3. Can I get away with taking on c2? There's bishop f4. e5. So the first thing, I'd probably stop there and I think, well, that's very sharp, right? I'm not really sure what's going on. So CD4, Knight D4, again, B4, 
rather than going too far down knight b5 queen b yeah, i'd have a look around and see you know maybe white has other moves there does he have f3 for example f3 does d5 f3 d5 if e5 then knight takes e5 is possible if e d then knight takes d5 that should be okay for black there's also, again, after f3, you have to think about knight b5 is a potential move. Knight b5, queen b8, again. Or queen d8, another move. Maybe I iron up queen b6, check. So cd4, knight d4, b4 does strike me as, as being a possibility. Maybe not the best uh, the black can play here, but... It is an idea. After cd4, there's also bishop takes b5 needs to be calculated. Bishop takes b5. Um, if bishop takes e4, then queen d4. But then there's bishop takes f3, gf3, e6. And black seems to be doing reasonably well because the white pawn structure is fractured. Could also go queen takes f3 in that variation. So cd4, I would expect knight takes d4. That looks like the most natural. I'm also seeing that this bishop takes e4 immediately there. Knight b5. Knight b5 again, threatening knight c7 check. And then queen b7. And then if f3, maybe I'll just drop the bishop back to c6. So cd4, the more I look at cd4, I feel like that might be the right move. Because I don't particularly like... Knight e4, bishop b5. I don't like bishop e4. Well, maybe I do like bishop e4, but bishop e4 you could just take on c5, right? And that's probably quite good for white. If you go d c5, I could take on b5. Although there's still bishop f3, gf3, e6. But then bishop g5, right? Bishop g5, queen c8. Looks dubious for black. Bishop takes f6, gf6. Knight c3, bishop e7. Might also be moves like queen d2 around about there. Queen d2, threatening rook b1. Seems dubious for black. So yeah, this is the whole point about calculation. Then you forget where you are. So do you go through one move at a time, or do you keep flip? I mean, I, I, this is where my calculation is a little bit indisciplined. I tend to flip through. You know, again, there was this famous advice by Kotov. He, he created this thing called the opening variation tree. Um, or I'm not sure if that was his creation, but he talked about it in his book, uh, which was. Uh, Think Like a Grandmaster, very famous book, very big seller. So when I one of the first books I did was called Cat Clay Like a Grandmaster, and I did it for Annabelle books, which originally were bats for chess books, very popular. And they said that one of the uh, books that they did, which was very popular, when they thought the name for my book was Think Like a Grandmaster uh, by Alexander Kotov, who was a famous Soviet chess grandmaster because that was one of their better sellers. So I eventually was, my book was called Calculate Like a Grandmaster. Still available to buy if you want to buy that book. Um, but uh, Think Like a Grandmaster, yeah. So in Think Like a Grandmaster, he talks about this only variation tree. So you identify candidate moves, and then uh, obviously the variations, the sub-variations branch out from those original candidate moves. I kind of prefer Adam's way of approaching it, that you try and you identify a candidate move and you try and refute that candidate move. You try and see if there's anything wrong with it. Is there anything tactically wrong with it? If there's not, and you intuitively feel that that's a good move, you, you know, you then select that move. Again, I could cheat here. I'm going to cheat here and say, what does the engine think? Yeah, what does the engine think might my, my see? It actually doesn't like that move. Now, the reason it doesn't like that is because it thinks after this. I was just in queen b8, but it, it doesn't really like this. Now, why doesn't it? It, it quite likes uh, bishop takes e4. 
And I said something like this might be reasonable, but actually here you don't take on f3, which is bad. But you go bishop c6, okay. So I did a reasonable job in calculating that, but not a great one. Let's go to another game. Luke Machine Musard. Okay, this is very, again, very concrete, very sharp. So, you know, I think a lot of amateur players, where they often struggle is, is they play their, um, they play the opening in a very routine way, in a very automatic way. They don't think about their moves, you know, they just play instinctively. I think the difference is when you play against guys like Luton Shane and Musard and Adams and Volokit and Super GMs, they're always calculating. And they will think in your opponent in their opponent's time as well. So that is one thing you could take into your own games is you know, um don't just switch on after the opening phase. A lot of people just take the opening phase very routinely. They think, well I've, I've prepared this, I know this, I don't need to calculate. Calculate at all times. Even in Blitz games, I played against Adams in Blitz and he would mention lines after the game. I'm like, wow, you saw that in a Blitz game? You know, I don't even calculate in a Blitz game, right? I just just play intuitively. Well, you, you know, you play rapid play. I played against a Ukrainian GM, Miroshenko, and I remember playing him in a rapid play game in the tournament in Belgium. And he mentioned all these lines after the game and I thought, well... I should have been trying to calculate some of this. But I didn't bother to calculate any variations because I was just playing on the field. You know, it was a rapid play game. Can't bother to calculate. Just play on the field. Well, surprisingly, I lost. You know, so unsurprisingly, I should say, I lost. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, well, I was being sarcastic the first time. I had a bit of an issue on the bus earlier. I was on the bus and, uh, open the window some guy slammed it really clutch, really hard because it's quite cold where I live in northeast of England it's pretty cold at the moment I'm not sure what the temperature is probably about five or six seven degrees feels pretty cold and on the bus that gets amplified because the air is rushing through the bus when you're on the motorway so the guy just slammed it. You get that a lot. You know, some people, they say, oh, do you mind if I close? And then other people just get up and they just slam it. I just thought, as I said, since sarcastic, oh, cheers for that, mate. You know. But after Queen B6, this is white to play against Musard. Two quite dynamic players, I would say. Two quite uncompromising players, I would describe these two as. So the obvious threat is that you're going to take, you're going to take the bishop. How did this uh, line originate? So one thing you can do when you look at a variation. Years ago, um, a French GM called Laurent Fresnay, who's quite famous uh, as a second, you know, as well as being a very good player, he mentioned line 96 as being the best way to play. White goes C4, he wants the more cut, more cozy bind, you go Queen B6. After E5, what I'm often goes bishop b5 check but here Luke Machine just went knight b3 now you go d5 this is the whole point that because the knight isn't on c3 yet you go d5 because you've gone f3 rather knight c3 you go d5 so this is some kind of theory uh white can take the, the knight so the first move is obviously you know what happens if you take the knight that's the most forcing move right so again with calculation very very important to start off with checks and captures and that's a basic rule that even strong players like you know like myself or I like to say I'm a strong player or you know or title players often forget David Howe mentions this a lot in his commentary and writings that it's very easy to forget about this basic rule which is just um checks and captures on every every move you know just go through the basics and he says if you train yourself to do that you will see uh like a quality of rise in your results or i can't remember what exactly what he said but bishop takes b5 is obviously a move it's probably some kind of preparation by both players now the question is do you take with the queen or do you take with the pawn my feeling is you take with the pawn because you want this idea of going bishop a6 to cut the king in the center, if you take the pawn, 
The guest black is okay here. You can either take with a pawn or go. So again, calculation. There's bishop b4 check. There's bishop a6. So let's go back to initial position. Let's calculate this. So bishop takes c6, bc6, cd4. Now bishop a6, I can go d5, but then there's uh, moves like rook d8, hitting the queen. Rook d8, queen c2. Now I can either go bishop b4 check. Again, we've got the tree, the coat of tree. Because again, I've got a choice in a long variation. I can also go, there's also moves like bishop d3 might be a move. And also knight d7. So bishop c6, b c6, c d4, bishop a6, uh, d5, rook d8, queen c2, knight d7. What's that variation like? Sometimes it's based on feel, you know, you feel that that position you get to in your calculation is okay for you. If, if it is, if it, if it is, you, you don't need to calculate it exactly. You just need to maybe, you know, sometimes, a lot of times with calculation, you're relying on, on gut feeling, right? So bishop c6, b c6, c d4, bishop a6, uh, d5, rook d8, queen c2, knight d7. But is that variation good or not? You're now threatening knight takes e5, where you'd still be a pawn down, but you'd have very huge threats. There's f4 there. Possible. It feels quite shaky for, for both sides. Uh, maybe after f4, there's bishop b4 check. Knight c3. This variation does look a bit risky for white. You, your king's stuck in the center. But after knight c3, you're now have ideas of casting queenside. But now I'm so also seeing another possibility, which is that after I've made a mistake in my calculations, because after bishop c6, b c6, c d4, bishop a6, d5, rook d8, queen c2, knight d7, f4 is a mistake because queen e3 wins on the spot. Queen e3 check, because the, the, the e3 square is now uh, no longer defended by the bishop on g5. So after, after knight d7, you can go bishop f4. However, then there's knight takes e5 anyway. Because I've already seen this queen e3 chart, I'm now jumping to knight e5 in my calculations. Bishop e5, queen e3, and it's mate next move. So bishop c6, he clearly, I think he wants to take with a pawn. But Luke Michel will realise all this, and he would also consider maybe that, you know, when you see those variations, maybe you don't take on c6, right? These are looking more and more scary for what? There's also bishop c6, b c6, and the idea of taking on f6 is also possible. However, that would weaken the e3 square. So bishop c6, b c6, bishop f6, g f6, c d4. Again, I'm looking at moves like bishop a6. And it feels like, you know, certainly from Black's point of view, I don't know what White would calculate there. From certainly from Black's point of view, it feels quite a comfortable position, right? You've got all these ideas like Bishop H6, Bishop B4 check, bring the rook to D8. You know, all that activity for one pawn. So I calculate that and I think, well, that's quite scary. So in a practical game, I'm then looking at other moves. I'm thinking. Actually, maybe I shouldn't be taking on c6. Maybe I should be playing a move like queen d3 or queen e2. Queen e2 feels very kind of natural in many ways. You put the queen out on e2. On the other, on the, on the downside, you may not be threatening to castle just yet because there's either d takes c3 or d3 check. So after queen e2, black could consider Moves like bishop a6. So again, we could cheat again. How close was the calculation to the true evaluate? I would say I would evaluate. It's also evaluation very important when you calculate because, you know, not only are you evaluating the position on, on the board, but it's also very important to evaluate the position that you reach in your calculations because otherwise, you know, what are you aiming for? What are you actually aiming for in your calculations, right? So in this position, um, I'm evaluating after bishop c6, b c6, black's position is pretty good. Yeah, so it does favor, I don't think it probably, probably won't like this move, or it seems to be very, 
murky. So I suggested bishop a6 as a possible move. It's just a5 as another option, but it's clearly that it feels like this would be some kind of preparation. Now, how bad is bishop a6? Again, this is where candidate moves and not assuming that a line is forced is very, very helpful because I did not consider the move knight to a3 in my calculations. I only considered taking here, which is, um, what about rook d8? Not so great, actually, because queen c1, the knight's pinned. Again, so my calculation a bit shoddy today. Not great. Maybe we can improve on it in a future video. There's something to improve. So I know I've got I need something I need to improve on. You know, I'm missing moves. I'm missing knight a3 is a move. I'm missing that after you take, you don't bother with rook d8, you go knight d7. But I did see that knight d7 was present in a position. Black has a good position. The computer, though, suggests after bishop a6, we go knight a3. Very interesting. And... White has quite a good game. The rook is coming to c1, the knight is coming there. What about bishop d4 check? We just go bishop d2, actually. And you're doing pretty well. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think a lot of humans, or a lot of even good players, would, would, would not like this variation for white. Because your king's in the center again. You know, black looks very active. Your knight's on a funny square. You're a pawn up, but... Computer doesn't mind about this, doesn't, you know, it doesn't fear ghosts and it thinks, you know, a pawn is a pawn. So you might get to this position, you might evaluate it as unclear or maybe even good for black, but the computer prefers white, so that's very interesting. Um, however, instead of bishop a6, it actually likes to move a5, which is a really good move, right? And uh, again, move I didn't even really consider. And one of the ideas is just to go a4, because this knight is doing a very good job of keeping the queen under control, so the queen can't jump into b2. So again, the computer understands a5 is good. On the other hand, there is this option of going queen d3, which does look very natural as well. I said queen e2, not quite as good. Queen d3 does feel very natural. So quite possible. That, I, I, feel, I would say more probable than... Possible that Luke Michelin will go Queen D3, but we'll have to see. We'll come back to that game. There's this game as well. Okay, it's kind of given away by the computer. Sheriff's Royal is playing white. And the computer is suggesting the move A4, because I think that's why the arrow was, was there, right? So A4. So if you're Sheriff's Royal... We discussed before, he's originally from India, but now living in the UK, and is a UK, certainly an England person through and through now. Uh, English chess player. But I say, you know, when I say originally from India, that was like very early in his life that he came over to the UK. And um, in this position... But Gukesh, of course, is Indian, right? And he's part of this wave of very, very good players. Uh, and Gukesh is trying to get into the candidates. Uh, people are saying that this tournament is set up for him to win and, and to gain points and potentially qualify the candidates. Well, good. You know? We want to see the best players in the candidates, right? Okay, so white to play. So a4, how would you calculate this variation? a4. Why is a4? Firstly, you question, like, why is a4 a good move? Uh, well, partly it's, it's, it's so that white has the option uh, of moving to a3 with a bishop, but also to go a5 and soften up the black queen side. So that b6. So at the moment, the black structure, if we look at the black structure, brought on a7, b6, c5, very, very solid. Um, so can we try and calculate a long variation? So a4, knight e4, let's say knight e4 looks like a natural move, bishop d3, and queen e7,
Okay, queen c2, knight g5, knight takes g5, queen takes g5. Well, I don't know that I mean, anyway because he went g3. <laughs> but I didn't really see anything great there for white, I'll be honest. I, I mean, the position... The position is positional, you know. The game is positional. It's there's no tactics here. It's more about strategy. So actually, calculation in positions like this is probably not quite so relevant. It's more about you know figuring out the position, understanding the strategic elements of the position, using your your previous knowledge. I'm sure Sheras has probably studied positions like this before. He has some understanding of what to do. I would say the same is true of Gukesh as well. Um, so then you are, yeah, you're using your knowledge and, and you, and of course your, your calculated variations don't get me wrong, but it's, it's probably, maybe you're not quite, you're not quite in the calculation zone as much as you would be in a very sharp forcing position. So why is G3 a good move? Why did Sheras play a G3? Yeah, not exactly certain because if you go bishop g2 and then move the knight and exchange bishops, that's probably what black wants. Um, so sometimes when you calculate as well, you're thinking about what your opponent wants to do. So when you're like, if we go back a move, you could use the old Russian maxim, what does my opponent want to do, right? What does black want to do? Well, it doesn't seem to me very clear what black is intending here. You know, and that is the way to form your own way of playing the position, you know, the way to kind of instruct you how to play the position. And sometimes you use prophylaxis, you will use prophylaxis, this is the way Karp have always approached positions, use prophylaxis to try and shut down his opponent's ideas. Does G3, but do we understand what does black actually want here? It doesn't seem that clear to me what black is intending to play. Uh, maybe knight G6. Maybe 94. Maybe just wants a general improvement. Maybe there is no specifically obvious move that Black wants to do here. Um, but maybe Sheras was concerned about ideas where Black would take e takes and then go queen f4. So that in that sense, g3 makes some sense. Maybe not even immediately, but maybe at some point Black would go knight g6 and improve that idea and eventually take, and then you're generally going to take back the e-pawn. Because if you take back the knight or the bishop, then you have not a great structure. So he's gone g3, and maybe that that's the idea behind it. And he's not really concerned. I mean, the only thing I would be concerned about here is why. You've weakened that long diagonal. You, you're clearly making that bishop on b7 even more relevant. So what does black let, let me let me have my cup of tea and think about what black should play now. So the first move, the most forcing move is queen c6, because they're threatens to win a piece. You can't move the knight because you'll get checkmated. If you move the knight here, it's the end of the game, right? However, the very obvious response is bishop g2. Now why is bishop g2 a good move? I guess you just wrote the knight h4, right? So I feel like this game is very positional. Let's see what the computer again. Let's we could we could cheat again. We could cheat and see what the computer thinks about this position. It does like my knight e4. I think that's always a good move for black in these kind of middle games. Knight e4 is a good move. Yeah, and black's quite comfortable. So actually, yeah, a4 is given. So actually, g3 is a slight mistake. You've gone from slightly better for white to slightly worse. I kind of do feel like Gukesh will win this game, mainly because of the ma massive rating difference. Um, but we'll see anyway. So, uh, another very sharp game in this one. How did, how, what was he aiming here? Martin Tabard. To buy, who I believe is from, is he from Azerbaijan? 
I'm not sure. Nikita Vitiugo was originally from Russia, but now represents England. Very good player as well. But uh, he's had a few let slip this tournament. So again, shows how much fear these guys know. What was he opening again? It was some kind of night off, right? But he went with F4, which is a slightly unusual line. It has very popular. I mean, that can also go G6, but E5 is quite a critical way to take it on. It's interesting here that white just goes very sharp with G4. So clearly, you know, and then black responds with a classic counterattack in the centre. He's not worried about necessarily losing a pawn so much. It's more about activity. And also, I'm not sure white can win a pawn because if you take on D5 with a knight, I take, take, and then F4 is dropping. So he went G5, and then again, after G5, the problem with knight E4 is his knight takes D5. I guess that was... Well, but there's still you can move the queen, so that was possible. Uh, but he went d4 and then uh, he took. Our bishop takes and now white well, went f5, he took. So it's it's now white's play. Black's just played knight c5. What, so white has to calculate this variation, this position, I should say. What is happening? You know, what is going on, as Marvin Gaye once said. Okay. What we will calculate here is cast as queen side. Because if I cast the queen side, I'm then threatening um, queen d8. However, there is then bishop takes f5. Which is not very obvious reply. Um, and if bishop f5, uh, then um, black is now threatening knight b3 as a counter attack. Knight b3, cb3, queen b1. So castles. Um, let's say bishop f5, bishop c5, bishop c5. Yeah, it doesn't look it doesn't look great for white because if if bishop d three does uh well just queen f three should be fine. There's ideas of bishop e three. I don't certainly don't think white would be better. Maybe you can go rook f one and get some material back. But, uh, so cast uh, so castles as bishop f five. Is there any way to bust that bishop f five move? I don't see an obvious way to bust it. I think Vitty Hugo is kind of not really showing how strong he is at the moment. I mean, you know, if he converted some of those winning positions, then he'd be, you know, in a very good position in this tournament. But he's he's still in reasonable shape. So you know, I feel like it could be something more to come from him. Um, and his position looks quite reasonably promising to me out of the opening. So I'm not really sure what white does here, actually. This, the more I look at this position, the more it looks quite reasonable for black. I don't know what level of preparation this was, but it seems like Vitty Yugov has got a good position. Should we use the computer to confirm this? No, I'm completely wrong. He's absolutely busted. So again, my calculation, I'm getting a bit lazy, I think, now. Nah, it's not my game. It's not my game, people. It's not my game. Apparently, knight g5 is the right move, which I didn't really consider, because I thought we well, kind of just take on f5, but actually, maybe that's rook f1 then. Yeah, because I thought you could just take, but I, I missed the, the just simple move, rook f1. So the point is, now, if you go check, I go rook g3. And uh, black is in big trouble because of here, then you take. Wow. Yeah, my calculation should have been up to that. Now, if you take, I go queen d5. And that really is Busto City. King back. Well, you just take. And everything is starting to hang. Dreadful position for black. So. Very interesting moment. Like if uh, Martin finds knight g5, he's basically already more or less, according to the engine, he's already winning. So where was the mistake by Black? 
This is all fine. Could also consider simple move b6, develop the bishop, don't worry about the pawn. Yeah, that seems quite reasonable. It's getting very sharp. These kind of positions are very, very sharp. The king's in the center. You know, you've got all these activity moves to deal with, like rook g1. Bishop f8 was fine. The big blunder was knight c5. Knight f6 was the move. The knight c5 was a shocker. Allowing, it's not so obvious that knight g5 is winning. But it's just associated with this knight takes f7 idea. So that's something that even very strong players like Fiti Yuga will often miss. These kind of surprising moves like knight takes f7. You know, where they could slip up, they're probably not going to slip up very often in technical positions, in end games, in positions that require understanding. But in sharp positions that require very, you know, where unusual moves might appear, they can often just look as weak as any of us. Because, uh, you know, these are the kind of positions that are chaotic and difficult to understand. So that's that game. There's one more game we haven't covered. We haven't tried to do any long calculation. This is Hans Neiman versus Bartel. Again, it's kind of positional, but also kind of sharp at the same time. So somebody was mentioned earlier that Hans Neiman is an extremely well-prepared player. I'd agree with that. I think he's very well-prepared. There is a little bit of a controversy going around because he had a very good tournament and a tournament in peace in Croatia. But having said that, there were no controls in terms of scanning, scanners there. So people were arguing that they had a delay, which apparently wasn't implemented from the start, but was implemented at some point during the tournament, and hands continued to play well. But at this tournament, there's a lot of security controls in the London Chess Classic, so would not be a good idea to cheat. But if Hans was cheating and a tournament of peace with delay, he would need a device at the board. Because how would it, you know, I mean, or it would be difficult to kind of cheat with an outside source with a partner um, if there's a delay, I would assume. Because their information, these games are delayed as well. So when we're seeing the game, it's 15 minutes, it's 15 minutes further on. For all we know, Hans might have already lost, or Bartel might have already lost, or they might have already agreed to draw. It's probably also the using Sophia rules. So the computer's saying that naive three is the best move. So let's figure out why, what black would do after knight e3. So let's say knight e3, let's calculate again a variation, knight e3. And try and, I'll be made to look stupid by the computer. Knight g3, queen g6 is screaming out at me. So my candidate move is queen g6. We haven't really talked a lot about candidate moves today. That's often where I've been slipping up in the calculation. There were quite a few moves, quite a few games where I missed the candidate moves. Uh, some candidate moves like that knight a3 in the Luke Shane game. In one of those variations, I missed that move. Uh, or that a5 idea in the same game. Knight e3. Queen g6 is a move. What does white play? Uh, knight d5, uh, g3, hg, hg, uh, fg, queen g3, knight takes c7, so knight f6, knight takes a8, knight g4, Knight f3, rook takes f3. So that's one.